thanks for joining us here today at Victory Church, where we invite people to belong before they believe. If you want to know more about who we are and what we do, or if any of our messages have impacted your life and you would like to partner with us in giving to this ministry, we invite you to do so by visiting our website at victory.church. Now, let's check out this week's message from our lead pastor, John Chesting. Morning, Victory Church. We're so glad that you're here. What an honor to have you here today. Those of you at the Edmond campus, it's a joy to be joining you right now. Those of you that are watching from the Grapevine campus or watching online, we're honored to have you. Uh, this song that we just sang, I love, I love the words that it, that song starts with. And I was kind of doing a little working on my phone down there, looking up some stuff. The song starts by saying, behold him now. And if you look up this word behold in the Hebrew, what is literally translated to mean is open your eyes. Like, hey, wake up, wake up. And, and really what happens, I love church and, we can, and you can experience God's presence anywhere, but something really great happens in church when we come into church and when you sense the presence of the Lord, what's happening is it doesn't mean God was like, oh shoot, I gotta hurry up and get over there. But like he was already here. We just beheld him. We, we, we said, behold, look, he's right here. He's in our midst. And I love, I love this song for a lot of reasons. I love the part where it says, king of heaven, king. Uh, in the Bible, if you go back into the Old Testament, did, did you know that God never intended for us to have kings? I know it's a weird time to talk about this. God's design would that, would, would that he would be our king, but the people demanded a king. They said, we want to be like all the other nations. We want a king. And God's like, hey, listen, I don't really want you to have a king, but okay. So he gave him Saul. And I just think it's good for us to recalibrate our hearts sometimes and say, you're the king. You are king of kings and lord of lords. And we shift our affection in that way. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad that you came to church today. We're going to have a good time. Hey, before you're seated, I want you to turn around, find a couple faces you've never seen before and just shake their hand, introduce yourself to them. We're welcome. We welcome you today. Um, for those of you watching online, we honor you. We're glad that you're with us. We're glad that you're watching no matter where you're watching from. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Maybe you're uh, traveling, vacation. Maybe you're from out of state. Maybe you're from out of the country and you're joining us today. We're so honored. Uh, that you're joining us today. So thank you for being here today. And now I'm rambling because they won't stop talking. So now I'm just talking to you. We're having a conversation until they stop talking in the room. No. Welcome to church. You guys look good. You're supposed to say, you do too, John. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to have you all here. Uh, glad that you're here today. This is a very nostalgic day for me. Um, uh, this, this exact day, 10 years ago, I have pictures on my phone. I was looking at them the other day. Um, I, this is my 10 year anniversary today, 10 years. Can you believe that? It's crazy. I became the pastor when I was 15 years old. Can you believe it's been 10 years? It's crazy. <laughs> now I'm lying in church. That's never good. Um, no, I am so honored. Uh, feels like yesterday and it feels like 50 years ago at the same time, but it is one of my greatest honors uh, to be the pastor of this church. And so, so thank you for, for sticking with it. I know those first few years were rough and uh, I didn't know what I was doing. You probably knew that though. Uh, but God, God has been faithful, hasn't he? God has been so faithful to this house. And so um, glad that you're here. Uh, today's going to be a little bit different, as though every week hasn't been a little bit different lately um, at Victory Church, but um, I, you guys probably don't know, uh, but there's something happening this week in a couple of days. You probably don't know about it, but uh, there's, there, there's an election this week. Feel that tension right there? You can just feel it right there. It's just, <laughs> you just stop talking and there's tension. Um, so I, wanna, I, wanna, I, want us to, I want us to, really my, my intent today is... My main focus today is we're going to pray for our nation, and I'm going to walk you through five things that we're going to talk about, pray, talk about, pray, talk about, pray, and we'll get to that in, in just a few minutes, but I, but I want to just chat with you for a little bit as your pastor or as a pastor, if I'm not your pastor. Um, this, this, by far, honestly, is the hardest time uh, to be a pastor for me, about every four years around this time, really hard. 
uh, in 2020, it's funny, in 2020 when all the COVID stuff was happening, uh, I remember this, this day um, in, in the thick of it whenever somebody in our congregation reached out to us and said, if you require masks, I'm leaving the church. And the exact same day, another person reached out and said, if you don't require masks, I'm leaving the church. It's like, what a conundrum, you know? These are the, the challenging times leading churches where there's opinions and thoughts. And that particular example is what you call a lose-lose situation. <laughs> or some might say it's a win-win. Maybe neither one of them. Maybe I don't want either one of them. I'm just kidding. That's not the right thing. So, so I want to I want to talk a little bit about politics, and I want to talk a little bit about this subject um, in in what I hope is a healthy way. And before I ever even get started, I'm well aware that for some of you in the room, I I I won't say enough, and for some of you in the room, I've already said too much. <laughs> what a conundrum! <laughs> so. I want, to, I want to try to unpack this a little bit today, you know, a big question. And I, I, I write on this. I, write, I try to write every week if I can. And I have this website. If you ever want to read, I love to write. And so I'll write every week. If you ever want to follow along, you can go to releader.co. It's a website called releader.co. And it's a, you just sign up for the free subscription. I wrote about that this, this week. I wrote about the idea of politics in church. And I wrestled with this tension and um, so I have a lot more to say there if you ever, if you ever want to go and read that. It's, it's very easy to make a biblical case that politics are in church or in the Bible. It's very easy. Very, very easy. It's all over the Bible. It's the book of Daniel, you know. Elijah was political, talking to kings and shifting cultures. Elisha was political. Esther Y'all know Esther was, was political. And so you see it all, all through Scripture. It's, it's pretty easy to make a case. Moses confronted Pharaoh. Yep. So there's, there's all kinds of cases to be made about Christians or Christ followers and, and politics or even, even church and politics. But I'll, I would also, you know, I'm going to kind of go back and forth. One minute you're going to think I'm thinking one thing, and the next minute you're going to think I'm thinking the other thing. But you're going to have to stay to the end if you want to know what we really think. So you could easily make a case that politics are all through the Bible, but you could also look at Jesus. Um, think about the time in, in the history that Jesus decided to come to this earth was one of the most political times for the nation of Israel in, in Jerusalem. Uh, they were under Roman authority, you know, Pontius Pilate and Herod and all of these things. And they were, they were basically coming and lording over the Jews. And that's the reason Pontius Pilate was there. That's the reason Herod was there, is they were keeping law and order. They were taxing. They were doing all the things of, of impeding their political landscape onto the nation of Israel. And when, when Jesus came, all of the Jewish people thought the Messiah was going to, to, to deliver them from the Roman Empire. They, they were wanting Jesus to be political. They really were. And you can, uh, there's, this, there's this passage in, in Luke. So, so Jesus is resurrected from the dead. They're on the Emmaus road. And Jesus is walking with these two guys and they're just talking. And the Bible says that Jesus goes back all the way in history and talks about all of the messianic prophecies of the coming Messiah. And, and they don't recognize that it's Jesus. And then they literally told Jesus, they didn't realize they were, that it was Jesus they were talking to. But in Luke 24, 21, it says, we had hoped that he, being Jesus, was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Like, man, we had every hope that Jesus was going to come and believe, be our political savior, that he was going to come and do what only the Messiah could do. And what they didn't realize is that Jesus was coming to be the redeemer, but it was way bigger than just some political landscape in that time. It was for all of mankind, for all of eternity, for the future. He was a redeemer, right? He was, he was a redeemer. And then another instance in, in the book of Acts, um, in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, it says, this is, this is the early church, Acts 1, it says, then they gathered around him and asked, this is, they're saying this to Jesus, Lord, are, are, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? They're like, Jesus, please, 
restore our kingdom because the Romans have come and taken everything. Will you please restore this earthly kingdom of Israel? And then we know whenever Jesus is being crucified, he, he's in front of Pontius Pilate and Pontius Pilate is saying, is it true that you're the king of the Jews? What is this deal? What kingdom are you of? And Jesus literally answers him in John 18, 36. And Jesus says, my kingdom was not of this world. And, and Jesus, you look at all of his parables. Many of his parables are about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like, there's 12 parables that Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven. And it's, he's, it's like he's constantly saying, hey, I, I take your eyes off what's happening around you and fix your gaze upon another kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus is constantly redirecting and shifting. And the, the book of Acts is the early church, massive growth, massive. When the church was birthed and the church came on the scene, read all through the book of Acts. They're, they're, they weren't involved politically at all. What are you saying, John? I'm saying that there's a biblical case for politics involvement and there's one for not. And for some reason, we always have this, this divide where it's like, well, we should talk about it in church. Well, we shouldn't talk about it in church. I don't know that it's either or. I actually think it's and both. And, and like, well, how's that possible, John? How do you talk about it but not talk about it? Well, that's what I want to talk about. <laughs> <clears throat> I, think, I think we're supposed to care for the nation. Amen. I really do. The proof of that is because God cares about nations. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show you. Um, I won't just say it. God cares about nations. Watch this, Acts 17, 26. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth now watch this. This is, this is talking to us. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. Psalm twenty two twenty eight says this, for dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. Why would he care? Why would he rule over something he didn't care about? <clears throat> God does care about the nations. Psalm 67, four says this, may the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. What does he do? He guides the nations. He cares about the nations. So what do we do? How do we, how do we navigate this minefield, you know, as Christians and as believers? I, I think it's and both. I think we have action. We're, we're involved. We care about America. We're involved about America. We're intentional about America. And simultaneously we are more we are less committed to a flag than we are a cross see what i'm saying i'm not saying it's either or i'm saying it's and both so how do we do this as christians you know what's what's a healthy way if we're going to approach this as christians how do we do it well i got three things i want to share with you that i that i, that I want to give us some direction on okay how do we navigate this week when you're at work and you're dealing with people and you're on social media and you're so tempted? Number one, I would say this, we need to pray consistently. And that seems like such a cliche thing, doesn't it? Like just another pastor telling me to pray. And in just a minute, after I'm done rambling, we're gonna pray. I think there's something really powerful when all of our campuses come together at one time and we pray about the same thing in the same moment at the same time. And so we never want to want to lose sight of the importance of prayer. Well, like, I don't even know where I would be if I didn't instill this in my life. I remember when this church, I, I just attended this church. You, most of you know my story. I, I was just an attender and they came to me and said, hey, we're starting an Edmond campus. Would you like to be the, the uh, we think you should be the campus pastor. I said, no. They came to me a second time. I said, no again. And then the third time, here's what they said. Have you prayed about it? No. No. Guess what I did? I prayed about it. So the power of prayer and the importance of prayer. I would have missed, I would have missed my destiny if I wouldn't have prayed about it. So shouldn't we pray for our nation? And shouldn't we pray for how we should respond to our nation? So, so we, we pray consistently. Second thing is we act lovingly. And, and what I mean by act is we have action. Okay? 
I'm not saying act in terms of like pretending, like acting in a play. I'm not saying that. I'm saying we have action, but we have action lovingly. (laughs) And this is where most of us, if we're going to mess up, this is the part. You know, we have action, but as believers, we're called to act lovingly. I saw a poll this week that said that um, the Barna Group did a poll, did a survey, and found that 40, this is crazy to me, it was like 49%, it was 41 million Christians are planning on not voting. 41 million. We should vote. We need to vote. Well, John, how do we vote? You, you vote biblically. You, you vote what the Bible says, you know? We, Lord knows we can't vote on personalities. So, so, so we act, but we act lovingly. The, the Bible says that Jesus came in truth and grace. Truth and grace, not either or, it was and both which tells us if Jesus did it, we can do it. We can actually speak truth with love. It's, it's, it's and both. We should stand for the unborn, right? We should stand for the unborn. We should stand on how the Bible defines marriage. We should, we should stand not for a candidate. We should stand for biblical truth, but we do it Help me, lovingly. We do it lovingly. I, I, our nation, the values of our nation are eroding before our very eyes. So we have action, but we have action with love. We need more Christians to run for office. That's what I think. Some of us should pray if, if, if we should run for local office. Some of us need to, to take a stand and, 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 and take more action that way. Christians should to talk to each other about what can we do outside these four walls to, to bring action to these areas of our life. And some people say, you know, I, I just, John, I just don't think politics belong in church. I actually agree with you. I actually agree with you, okay? But I heard a pastor say this last week and I, I could not agree more. He, he said, it's not, it's not that we're bringing politics to church. It's that they've brought theology into politics, and when politics become theological in nature, we have no choice but to speak into theology. So we speak into theology, but we don't necessarily speak politically, if that makes sense. So, so, so we pray consistently, we act lovingly, and the third one is we realign frequently. This is, this is so critical. Because what happens on number two, number one's easy, we pray. Number two, we, when we begin to act, you know what happens? Your emotions get involved, yep. right? And you get really worked up. And what we, what we require almost on a daily basis because of news and social media and phones and all the things that are surrounding us and speaking to us, we must realign. And another way to put that is we must recalibrate our priorities. Our, our number one core value as a church is we are kingdom-minded first. It means we're putting in order. We're, keep, we're recalibrating our thoughts to say, it's okay to be passionate and interested in a lot of things in this world, but first and foremost, I am kingdom-minded first. I know a lot of Christians, I'm just gonna say it. I know, I know, not a lot. I know some Christians that seem, I'm not saying they are, they seem more passionate about their patriotism for America than they are biblical truth in the kingdom of God. Yeah, one golf clap, I'll take it. Uh, today, I'll take anything I can get. I mean, I'll take a head nod if I can get it. I mean, whatever I can get today. Like, thank you, thank you. So, so, so this passage in, uh, in Philippians chapter three, verse 20, it says, but our citizenship is in heaven. <laughs> and we eagerly await a savior from where? From that place. Man, it's quiet in here. It, it means that there is no savior that this earth has to give us. There's only one place that a true savior can come. And I get it, y'all. I'm not naive. I got a passport. I know my citizenship. But I have a greater citizenship. I got two passports. 
<laughs> you know? So we have to understand that our citizenship, our true citizenship is in, is in heaven. Uh, Matthew, the, the disciples asked Jesus, Jesus teaches how to pray. And this is how he taught them to pray. He said, this is how you should pray. Um, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Taught them how to pray. There's another passage in Matthew 24, 35 that says this. Now, I'm going to say something that just don't throw anything at me. You promise. Okay. So Matthew 24, 35 says this. Now watch this. It says heaven and earth will pass away. So there is a day coming where it's all going to be gone anyways. It says, but my words will never pass away. Okay, I'm just going to say it. I'm just going to say it. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. Don't throw anything at me. There will come a day, whether it's a year from now or 4,000 years from now, that America will pass away. (laughs) John, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to get us to realign frequently. It's okay to act. It's okay to be involved. It's okay to vote for heaven's sake, vote for heaven's sake, take a stand for heaven's sake, fight for our nation and realign yourself over and over and over again to say, but, but the cross is more important. The cross is more important. Don't misunderstand me. Y'all I love this country. I'm a patriot. When I hear the national anthem, I get goosebumps. I get, I get goosebumps. When, when I see a veteran wearing a hat or a shirt, I stop. I don't care where I'm at. I will stop and look them in the eye and say, thank you for your service. Thank you for your sacrifice. I want a free country, right? I, I want a nation that's grounded on biblical truth. I, I want all those things. But I am way more interested in focusing on the kingdom of God. Uh, we were talking between services and Pastor Andrew that was our grapevine worship leader was with us this morning. And he reminded us of a passage of scripture in Joshua chapter five. You remember this part when Joshua is about to go into the promised land and he sees this person in the distance and it says that Joshua draws his sword and walks up to this guy. He didn't know it was an angel. And he says to this angel, whose side are you on? <laughs> and the angel of the Lord says, Neither. I'm the commander of heaven's armies. He's like, I'm not here to fight your fight. I'm here for a bigger cause, a greater cause, something that's heavenly minded, something that's kingdom focused. And so I would be a terrible pastor if I just sat up here and ranted about how we can make our country better without focusing your affections and your attentions back on something that's greater. Because the truth is, as a pastor and as Christians, y'all heard my heart. I'm all for it patriotism and fighting. I already said all that. If the worst case scenario happened to our nation, okay, as Christians, it doesn't change what I'm called to do. So did Jesus get involved politically? In the traditional sense, no, he did not. But I will say this, his actions on earth had political ramifications, right? So there were implications because of his actions. And I I get that. So what are we going to do? We're going to do and both. We're going to pray consistently. We're going to act lovingly. And we're going to realign frequently. But right now we're going to pray. Okay. We're going to pray. Not a single tomato was thrown at me. I crushed it. Okay. So here's what I do. I'm going to, I'm going to walk you through five prayers. So I'm going to mention it and then we're going to pray. And then I'll mention the next one and then we'll pray and so on and so forth. The first thing I want us to focus our attention and and our prayer on is the healing of our nation. Before we can move forward, we need to pray for healing. Our nation is very divided. There's a lot of brokenness, a lot of hurting. Um, a lot of division in second Chronicles chapter seven, it says this verse 14, it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins. And then it says, 
I will heal their land. So it's a promise. It's a promise. So let's just take a minute, all right? Let's just pray. Father, we thank you so much that you are a healer. In most instances, Lord, we think about this physically, that we pray for one another over sickness and disease. And we believe that too. We, we believe that by your stripes we're healed. But today our attention is focused a little bit more on a nation. And our nation is sick in many ways. And our nation is wounded. And our nation is hurting and reeling. And so Father, we just pray that you would come and be the healer. The Bible says that you are the great physician. The Bible describes Jesus as the balm of Gilead. And so we pray that you would come and put a balm on this nation. Something that could heal deep wounds. Wounds from our nation's past, Lord. Mistakes that our nation has made. All of the things that have brought us to this point and all the wounds that have taken place as a result. And we know, Father, that you love nations and that you care about nations. We see how you care for and love the nation of Israel and how you've brought healing and redemption and restoration. And Father, we pray that you would do that for our nation. Pray that you would come and bring healing to the brokenness. It's hard to move forward with a limp. It's hard to move forward with a gaping wound. So Father, we just pray that you would come and bring, bring healing. In whatever way that looks, Lord, for us individually, for us in our socioeconomic groups, in our nationalities, in our races, in our histories, in our time, in our individual experiences and generational experiences, Lord, that go back long before we walked this earth. Would you bring healing in a way that only you know how to do? Thank you, Jesus. Second thing I wanna shift your attention to is we're gonna pray for the leaders of our nation. Uh, not your favorite one, all of them. <laughs> so we're gonna pray for, for all the leaders. It, this passage, in the passage in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse one, it says, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Now watch what it says next. For kings and all those in authority. It doesn't say for those in your particular party that you really like. It says for all kings and all of those who are in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives. Man, doesn't that sound good? <laughs> in, all good in all godliness and holiness, this is good. This is good and it pleases God who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. If you don't know how to pray for those that you don't know how to pray for, that you despise and you can't, oh, how could anybody, ah, uh, you should pray for that person. Well, John, I just don't know how to pray. I'll tell you how to pray. Pray the last line of verse four, who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, this truth. All right, so let's pray for our leaders. Lord, we thank you for leadership. We know that organizations rise and they fall on leadership. We know that nations rise and fall on leadership. So Father, we come before you and we pray for our leaders. We pray for our local leaders of our cities, God, we pray for city council, men and women. We pray for mayors, Lord. We pray for our governors. We pray for our state senate and our state reps. We pray for every state, every rep, every senator. And yes, we pray for our nation's leader, Lord. The president of the United States, Lord, we pray. We pray that you would give them wisdom that comes from you. We pray that you would bring them truth your truth. And God, we can pray that you would bring salvation. And what we pray, Lord, is wake them up with dreams and visions in the middle of the night. God, stir their hearts, bring their affection towards you. 
all political things aside, Lord, you love them. You care for them. And God, we pray that they would experience your love, experience the salvation, the redemptive work of the cross. May they experience the cross and everything it has to offer. We pray for our leaders. We pray for both sides of the aisle, Lord. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, all right, let's keep going. So we're going to pray. This is a big one. This is a fun one. We're going to pray for unity. We're going to pray for the unity of our nation. This is a big one. You know, this might be the toughest one because we're a very divided nation. So this passage, I love this passage in Psalm 133. It says, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. And then it gives us a picture of what this should look like. It says, it is like, it's a simile. It says, unity is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on the beard of Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. And then, it, listen to this, this is so rich. It says, for there, what is there? Unity. For in unity, the Lord bestows his blessing, even life evermore. The importance of unity and, and the role that we play in unity. You know, it, the Bible describes unity that it flows from the top down. And we may think, well, that's not my job, John, because that's in the White House, that's in the, the Capitol, you know, I'm not up there, it flows from the top down. It flows from you down too. So when you go home today, it flows from you down. When you go to the office tomorrow to lead your organization, to lead your department, to lead your family, to lead your kids, the Bible says unity starts up here and it flows down from there. And what I like is it says in that place, God bestows blessing. So when you go home and you, you bring unity into your home, God's like, I can bless that. I will, I will bless this family. I will bless this home. I will bless this company. I will bless this department because of unity. And so we need to pray for unity, all right? Let's, let's do it. Father, we thank you for unity. Father, we're so <laughs> divided, our nation. So we pray that you would bring unity. May it flow from us. We can't control those above us, but I can control from me down. So God, may, may even the words of my mouth and the posts of my fingertips <laughs> be unifying in nature because we want you to bless it. The alternative is also, could also be said that you will not bless division. So may we be people of unity. God, we pray this week as our nation goes to the polls. God, we pray that there be unity Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. May there not be rioting in the streets. May there not be any wounded. May there not be any deaths. May there not be any looting or rioting in our cities. God, we pray that you would flow unity from the top down. And no matter who wins, Lord, may it be a unifying system. May there not be any, any fighting or standing in the gap, Lord. May, may there just be unity in the streets and unity in our hearts. In Jesus' name. Two more. Here we go. Two more. We're almost done. Fourth thing I want us to pray about is I want us to pray for God's sovereignty in our nation. What an interesting thing to pray for. It's odd. Um, as if God needs our prayers so that he can operate in sovereignty. This prayer is less about empowering God to do what he's gonna do anyways. Because guess what? Just because you pray it doesn't mean he's like, oh, well, John prayed it. I better hurry up and be sovereign. No, God's gonna be sovereign. It's who he is. When I pray that God would be sovereign, that his sovereignty would reign. You know what I'm really praying? God, soften my heart. Yes. Soften my heart. You know that even Jesus prayed this? When Jesus was in the garden, he said, Lord, if there's any way that this cup can pass from me, let's do that. 
But then he literally says, but not my will, Lord. Yours be done. What he's saying is, hey, I got some opinions. And I'd like it to go this way if possible. Lord, that's my opinion. And, and, and here's the cool thing. It's okay to pray for that. Jesus prayed for that. But ultimately his heart was recalibrated back to the Father to say, but Father, not my will. Yours be done. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You could also say, in my heart as it is in heaven. Amen. So let's pray for the sovereignty. So in this passage, let me read your passage first. In um, Daniel chapter 2, it says, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. Now watch verse 21. He changes times and season. Here we go. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. So Father, you taught us how to pray, so we pray it. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in America as it is in heaven. We need your will. We thank you for your sovereignty. And your sovereignty should bring us peace because we know that you reign above it all. We know that your ways are higher than our ways. And so why would we get all worked up and worried and stressed and anxious when you're the alpha and the omega? You know the beginning from the end. You've already recorded this. It's already been recorded what's about to happen. So God, may we just sit back and rest in your sovereignty. May we find peace there to know that we serve a God who loves us and is caring for us and already knows the end from the beginning. In Jesus' name, amen. One more. So this last one's my favorite because this is something we can believe for no matter what happens, okay? Number five, we're gonna pray for revival in our nation. Okay, let's pray for that. It's not as if God's in heaven going, well, if it goes this way, oh, revival's off the hook. Can't do it. You know? I almost did a presidential um, uh, impersonation there. I almost said, couldn't do, wouldn't be prudent, you know? <laughs> Let's pray for revival in our lands. Amen? In our churches, in our homes, in our families, in our hearts that just there would be a wave of revival that would sweep across our nation. Uh, Joel chapter two, verse 28 says, and, after, and afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. So Father, we just pray for revival. We even recalibrate and realign our hearts and our affections back to the kingdom and what we say, Lord, is bring your spirit and release a new wave, a new wind of your spirit in our nation. We don't even care where you start it, Lord. Just help us catch the wave. May it be a revival that impacts generations. maybe a new wave of your spirit that this nation has never seen before. And may your church impact culture instead of culture impacting your church. May you bring revival on this land, Lord. Show us how to do it, Lord. Give us innovation and insights. If there's anything we're doing that's keeping it from happening, if there's anything we're, we need to be doing to spur it along, but Father, more than anything, we just say, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Thank you that you are on the move. I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. Prepare us to run, Lord. Prepare us to run, Lord. Show us what revival looks like in this house. Show us what revival looks like in our homes. Show us what revival looks like in our hearts. 
So Father, we just say, bring revival to us. Rejuvenate. Restore. May your rivers, may rivers of living water flow through a dry and thirsty land. And it's not by might. It's not by power. It's by your spirit. And we welcome it. We welcome it. We thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray consistently. We're going to act lovingly. And we're going to realign frequently. Thank you for joining us here today for this week's message. And here at Victory Church, we are called to equip people to live in His presence, move beyond ourselves, and be transformed. And this can only happen through your radical generosity, your serving, and your prayers. If this message or any of our messages have impacted your life and you would like to partner with us by giving into this ministry, you can do so by visiting our website at victory.church. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.